As you can see, we are in New Orleans at AHA 16. You know, it's usually important that patients understand their risk factors and their treatment options, but a new study being presented here suggests that's not always the case for patients with atrial fibrillation. So I am here to talk with uh, Emily O'Brien, who is a PhD and an assistant professor of medicine at Duke Clinical Research Institute, DCRI. You know, you would like to think that patients have a handle on their condition and maybe even what treatment is trying to prevent. That may not necessarily be true. Talk about this survey. So, um, so thanks for having me. This is a really exciting survey for us to be involved in because we know a lot about the educational strategies to improve patient understanding of disease risk, but there hasn't been a lot of recent work that measures the uptake of that information and, and how well that's being integrated into clinical practice and communication with patients. So we use the Orbit AFib registry, which mm -hmm. is the largest outpatient registry for atrial fibrillation in the United States, um, recruited a thousand patients and asked them to complete a survey to give us information about their disease understanding. Um, we asked them what the major risk factor of atrial fibrillation is, and of course the right answer is stroke, and about 63% of patients strongly agreed that stroke was the major risk factor. Um, but a surprisingly high proportion agreed that other events that are actually not related to atrial fibrillation um, were risks of, of AFib. So about a third said that heart attack was, which was really striking, I think speaks yeah. to some sort of deficit in communication and understanding. You had a, a substantial proportion of patients who had never heard of warfarin, 13.5%, right. or NOAX, 9.8%. Right. Yes. So talk about disturbing. Yeah. Well, right. So um, certainly that for, um, for patients at high risk, um, based on their CHADS VAS score, discussion of anticoagulation treatment options is, is, is really important. And um, it's certainly possible that patients who were not indicated were the ones that didn't have those discussions, and that's why they are not familiar with anticoagulants. But um, in orbit, most of the patient it, patient population is high risk. So, so to they see, should have. they should, yes. <laughs> and, and we actually, you know, we tried to provide brand names and um, really do everything that we could to make sure that they knew what we were asking about and still saw those deficits. So it is disconcerting. So we know what works, we just may not necessarily be employing what works. So right. let's remind everybody what works. Right, so what works for, for patients who are um, at high risk for stroke with atrial fibrillation due to things like hypertension, being older, um, having had a prior stroke, diabetic, et cetera, um, anticoagulants are, are indicated. And the choice of anticoagulants um, is right now, as of the past five years, is, is different than it used to be. It used to be warfarin, the mainstay therapy, and now anticoagulants um, have been developed that are um, uh, potentially more convenient for patients, don't require routine monitoring, have fewer interactions, um, and we call those NOACs or novel oral anticoagulants. So um, both are effective for uh, reducing stroke risk and, and the balance between um, bleeding and and stroke risk for each, that should be part of the discussion between patients and providers. Um, and uh, we're hoping to, to learn more about that through the survey. And the providers don't necessarily have to do all the training themselves because they're so busy. There are ways of getting this education to patients. Yes, so there absolutely is, and, and we were interested in that. So we asked patients about the mechanisms um, for obtaining more information about atrial fibrillation. So we said, what is your top source of information for AFib? Um, and about 75% said that the provider was. So this patient population is actually relying heavily on their healthcare provider for this information. Um, a, a smaller proportion than I expected said that the internet was the top source, so that was around 13%. Um, so certainly there's a lot of health information out there, but it looks like for this older demographic, it's really the healthcare provider that um, they're relying on. So even if the provider doesn't do it him or herself, the best idea is to make sure it gets done. That's right, exactly. At some point, we'll get it, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know? We have but a lot of work to do. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, please look around because we have all of our coverage from AHA 2016 in uh, Cardiosource World News and Cardiosource World News Interventions. I'm Rick McGuire.